Hello and welcome to the developer commentary for Assault Android Cactus. I'm Sanatan Mishra. I'm Tim Dawson. And I'm Jeff Van Dyke. And we're going to be talking throughout the entire campaign about stuff that we find interesting. So this is the first level, of, uh, first level and we kind of put on an elevator to give you something interesting to look at even though the gameplay is fairly simple at this point. Yeah, it's really important to keep the first level accessible, so using a small space like the elevator uh, lets us bring in enemies in really small numbers while not overwhelming you. And even still, a lot of players when they get here go, wow, why are there so many enemies straight away? Mm. I've always really liked how the elevator accelerates there, it just adds this nice sense of pace. Yeah, it's, yeah a it's a good way of like adding movement and action to a level that's actually fairly static. You can get very intense. Especially when it crashes down at the end, that moment uh, shocks a lot of people because it's the first truly dynamic element across the entire campaign. Uh, it's also a lot of people don't even notice it because there's so much happening, but I like it. It's always been one of my favorite moments in the game. It's got a nice action beat. Um, I think this is the first time people get to experience the dynamic music as well. The intro, the main menu, and the tutorial are all kind of standard fare, but by now, they should be ramping up into that high intensity, low intensity. Uh, yeah, we wanted to make the music kind of uh, follow um, your play style and the, the the quality of your play. Yeah, I think that was your idea alone, right? Originally, that was yeah, it's it. it's a it's a it's an idea that's been around for ages. And, but I just thought it would um, it, I thought it would really apply to this game. I think it adds a lot. I'm very very happy that uh, you came up with that. Yeah, cool. Yeah, so this is Turbine, and it's based on one of the earliest prototype levels, actually. One of the first layouts I built was this kind of uh, round level with a couple of paths out of the main area. Uh, it was all based around trying to create choke points. I think it had a giant fan at one point, didn't it? Yeah, that's why it's still called Turbine, actually. Yeah. Even though the fan is now missing. It plays a lot better at this scale, though. I think this is somewhere around half the size it originally was, which was just a little bit too overwhelming for people and uh, also you ended up being away from the enemies quite a bit. I also like there's a caution sticker on the ground even though you can't pull off the edges. Well you have to be cautious, you gotta give people that scare. I've always enjoyed the aspect of this level the most where there's just so many enemies at some point that it becomes absurd but it's still fairly easy to deal with. It, it was the a really great moment for me because people would freak out when they saw it happen. They would get surrounded, they would get mauled, but then they defeat everything. It kind of works in line with the theme of the entire game, which is this sense of doing the impossible and overcoming ridiculous odds. This is a level that has a nice sense of uh, make teaching you. So when you first play it, you're taught to get out of the middle of the level when, the, when all the enemies drop on you. Um, but later you learn how to deal with it. So you kind of, you come back to it with veteran eyes and know how to Better, better handle threats. Mm -hmm. Well, the game ultimately rewards you for playing more aggressively, doesn't it? Mm. Yeah, it's a central concept to the entire experience, so very important to nail it down early on. It's also just kind of a simple level, I guess, which, which is really nice at this early point throughout the game. And here we have Filament, or my affectionately known level as, they're coming out of the walls! Which has no walls, but you get it. <laughs> so the uh, in the original earliest prototype of the game, um, you had a you had a torch all the time. So you, uh, wherever you faced, you you were lighting up. It, yeah, you're in the dark with a torch. And somewhere along the lines, I realized I kind of hated games that would set you in the dark with a torch. So that the game became really brightly lit. And this level was left in as kind of a reference to the <laughs> to that early early version. Well, I, th I think we worked around it as well, that the enemies have their own lights and indicators that are lit up in the dark, so you always have all the visual information you need, whereas those games that are centered around characters having torchlight, uh, especially twin stick shooters, it's really common. They often have that problem where you don't have the visual information, and so the entire game is spent backing up and praying that you know you get enemies in front of you. So we flipped it on its head a bit and you still get the visually interesting lighting but also the gameplay just works well. Yeah, yeah, and switching between the lights on and off is really cool. Uh, I, you know, I really like the, the flow it has because of that. Uh, also it has one of my favorite achievements ever, which is with Holly 
you can stand on the edge, shoot the cannonball, and as it runs out of energy, it will fall down and roll into a hole, and you get the nothing but net. <laughs> So this is Capacitor. Uh, this was this was a kind of I like this level because it's trying to tell a story. It's a story about a giant capacitor that's charging up. It's, it's deep. It is very deep. I, for one, was moved. Uh, it's also one of the first levels that demonstrates drastic, drastic change in the play space, and can make people really angry. Um, also make them really happy when they learn to deal with it. But at first, people are generally angry when the game does something difficult. <laughs> People don't like change. People do not like change. People like to be angry though. I for one like to be angry at games. Um, by now you should have tried out some of the characters as well. I usually have tried out you know, a couple different characters by this point in the game, so hopefully people are checking them out and finding their favorite. Um, I really don't didn't want people to roll into the first boss before they found something really comfortable. Uh, so that was a big priority of mine. This is, I think this is the first level where you really try to drop a lot of bombs on your head. Yeah, there used to be more. Not anymore. You can all thank me for that, players. <laughs> I vetoed the bombs. I always vetoed the bombs. That's how we lost the entire bomb level. But, you know, it works. And yes, that entire bomb level, that's never coming back. Ooh. So you're all safe. This is a, a bit like, uh, a bit like Descent, I like how this level ends with another big kind of moment. Yeah, it's one of the few instances where we got to toy with the graphics as well, right? You do that sweet long shadow lighting, which uh, we don't see anywhere else because we use the shadows for, for gameplay purposes. But yeah, it's, it's an interesting shift up and hopefully gives people a taste of what's to come. Ah, uh, Embryo. Uh, I've always really liked this level. Uh, mostly because it's got our friend Dan as the voice of uh, Embryo. He did such a fantastic job. Uh, the other thing is we also, uh, or I always think of the music of, of this level as being like, I don't know, like German techno or something like that. <laughs> I'm not sure why I feel that's suitable. Might have something to do with Dan, I don't know. <laughs> it does have that very dark kind of menacing feel to it and it worked great with his his uh, best robot voice impersonation. Yeah. I do like it too. It's also one of the first times where we get to demonstrate that there's kind of a story that happens throughout the campaign. Um, I thought uh, Tim came up with some really clever ideas for that with different characters having their own perspective and getting to drill down to something more than just the shoot everything gameplay. It was, it was really important to me that every character in the game um, felt like they were part of a spaceship and, and are working. Uh, they're, not, they're not soldiers, they're kind of repurposed um, things. So Embryo runs the, the loading bay. And I never ever rationalized why he has guns for arms. Well, I mean, it's obvious, right? It's super useful yeah, for any loading like bay high, director. High shelf. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Some things don't need explanations. Yeah. Get rid of rats? Yeah. He's a ratting robot? <laughs> Maybe they're attachments. Maybe he has regular hands and he's just put his gun arms on because Rebellion's going down. One of my favorite things about this boss was all the times we tested it with our friends uh, and they would die on the first phase. Almost every time. I think every friend I've ever had died on the first phase of this boss when we were initially testing it because they just could not figure out that you need to get close. None of them play shmups of any kind, so that was like such an interesting problem to solve where we you know, eventually change these bullet patterns a little bit and push you in and kind of guide you to what we want you to do, but I, I still think it was difficult even in the release version. I always found it funny at conventions, it was a uh, constant that people would play the boss and go, whoa, that's the hardest boss ever. <laughs> 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 little did they know. Congratulations, by now you have defeated Embryo and are on to the second phase of the game, Hive. Uh, well, this is kind of a cool moment because we get to introduce the first unlockable character in World 2 and not everyone's going to play them, but I think a lot of people are going to play Starch. We really tried to pick a fun character for the first unlock to encourage people to try and branch out and I, th I think it works pretty well. 
Yeah, I think she, she's, the micro missiles are just a really fun and visually spectacular weapon. And, uh, you know, the character's a fan favorite as well, so a lot of people just react really well to, to Starch in general. They get the humor. I love the music in World 2 as well. It's so different from the first world. It just, uh, I hope it surprises people, and that's kind of across the entire campaign. I, I generally hope the game surprises people, but especially here. I tried to make it so that as the level progressed, like the music really picks up uh, in tempo. Um, and uh, also, I don't know, it's like uh, from a mood point of view, the, there's the, the music in initially has a real sort of happy tone to it, uh, which um, not all of the music in the game is like that, but it just makes for a nice contrast. I think it's interesting as well that across the campaign the levels get longer and the complexity of the music kind of increases to match because each track needs to fill more space so you get the first taste of that here but it just continues across. Art-wise I really wanted to go somewhere different after the first world. Like I was almost uh, doing the uh, ready brown loading bay to just kind of get that out of the system and so the follow-up to that for that was the the greens and the, the white medical bay theme. It looks beautiful and it's kind of intense as well. I, I actually like this level for a similar reason to I like uh, Turbine because players already think, oh, they can't possibly throw more enemies at me and then we throw, you know, like a hundred wasps on the screen at once and just really freak people out. So this is Influx, uh, aka the level from the trailer that everyone remembers. Um, probably one of the most visually eye-catching moments in the game, I think. In some ways I regret that it's so deep in the game, as I've learnt later in my life people have very, very short attention spans, myself included. And this is you know, already midway through World 2. Uh, but when people get here, they, they are genuinely like wowed a lot of the time, which oh, is really lovely. Especially like when the, the level transition happens and the, the blocks fall away and, and fall into place. And it just feels awesome when it happens. And, it, and uh, it's really exciting. Surprisingly, this was one of the first things I ever worked on from a programming perspective with Cactus. And it just actually worked and it played well. And that shocked me because I don't know how to do any of that stuff. Um, it's, a, it's very, very simple in the back end as well. It just maps a pixel grid to every block and I can paint new uh, versions of the level and kind of get it up and running very quickly and that's why I was able to make all these interesting patterns and make them work so fast. It's an interesting example of generating uh, chaos and complexity out of a small number of parts. Uh, a lot of the look is is based on animations being offset, so you get this beautiful ripple effect when the levels transform. Oh yeah, I remember when you came up with that idea, because I had them all just transforming sort of instantly or at a set rate, and then you worked out that it would be cool to transform them based on the distance to the player, and then use that in four player as well, so it's always kind of relative to where the characters are and always ripple out from their position. It's practical as well because it means that the ground always changes first under the player, so they're less likely to run into a transforming block. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of tricks like that in the game where you think something's really dangerous, but it's oftentimes we're pretty lenient. So this is Oxygen. Um, I actually really like this level. It's very simple, it's basically a donut, but there's a bunch of interesting dynamics you get out of it, and I liked what I was able to do with the lighting. Again, it's another level where I'm where there's a, a, a kind of story progression uh, through from evening to morning. Yeah, I remember when we learned that lesson actually, uh, before we worked on Cactus, we were working on little jam games and things, and one piece of feedback we always got with anything arcadey um, was that the sense of progression would feel lacking if there wasn't a visual element. You could push through and have harder enemies and more crazy things going on, but Something like the aesthetic changing between different color grades of blue and red and green always gave people a much stronger feeling about the fact that something has changed, like they've moved forward in the progress towards completion. Um, I think this level works really well because of it, in, uh, not in spite of its complexity, but kind of together with 
its lack of complexity. A huge inspiration actually came from uh, the uh, old uh, Brisbane airport. They had this kind of circular uh, terminal with a trees and stuff inside it, where you could see it from as you walked around it. And so it was like, it was something something I drew on when I was trying to figure out how to how to visually depict this level. I think this is one of the few levels in the game where I didn't go back and rebalance the bomb-only wave that you are so obsessed with in your level tuning. Oh, and the number of times that's taken me out, I tell you. Oh, yeah. People, people got to dodge. I make no apologies. <laughs> it was fun. I find this level a lot of fun to play. The, um, the way the tracks, the moving tracks on the ground uh, mess with your movement uh, is fun and frustrating at yeah, the same time. <laughs> I always get amused when people play this level and they completely miss what it was inspired by. Um, it was a very direct inspiration for me uh, when I was designing it. We were playing a lot of Bomberman. <laughs> um, and yeah, it's just, I, I think it's great. I like this level. So like the, the other, the other uh, visual inspiration, again, like the previous level, was airports, uh, including the little flashing, uh, flashing hazard lights at the top, yeah. It also is one of the craziest levels for bullet patterns yet. You get bullet hell with Embryo, but this is the first level where we dump multiple turrets plus a bunch of drones simultaneously, and it gets pretty crazy. I, I always appreciated that about it as well. I really like the bits where um, the kegs start crawling out of the holes because you often get like four kegs crawling out of a very small hole and it really looks like they're just pouring out of somewhere. Mm -hmm. What about the bits where the platforms start popping up and down and you're trying to shoot your long range weapons <laughs> like a missile or a cannonball and you get the perfect shot lined up and it's going to get you that full chain, get you that S plus ranking and the platform pops up and blocks your shot. Do you love those moments? Because I can tell you from my experience on the, the internet, not everybody loves those moments. <laughs> But yeah, I think by and large this is one of the more interesting levels in World 2. Mm. What, do you, uh, what do you call it? Toaster dogs. <laughs> <laughs> the do. bane of my existence. Oh, they're great. Mm. You need your toast. <laughs> They've Maybe. toasted me a few times. Uh, the rockets can be very difficult to see amidst the chaos at mm. some points in this level, it's true especially towards the end when everything's moving so quickly. Mm. Uh, it does kind of work, and I think the chaos adds to its charm. Ah, uh, Vespula. Voiced by my wife, Angela, actually. And uh, I thought she did a really good job. This level, you know, you, you watch people play it and they struggle against it. And they think, wow, this is so much harder than Embryo. <laughs> Just watching people try to deal with the waves of wasps. It's uh, amazing, you know, uh, that it gets even harder than this. I really like the fact that people are just never sure that what the game is going to throw at them. And I think this boss does a perfect job of that. You're saying, yeah, she's super hard compared to Embryo, and that's kind of wonderful. You think the game is going to be all bullet hell, and it's going to be kind of Embryo-like, and you just have to learn the patterns, and then you have this, and it's... Oh, there's a hundred wasps on screen and they're circling around and they're moving out to get you. And also, yeah, Ange does a fantastic job with the voice. She's appropriately kind of menacing, but not evil and just really, really good. Kind of has that kind of melodramatic announcement mm. to things as well. Mm. She, yeah, did a really good job. I think I'm still most proud of the way uh, Vespula turns into a ball. That was mm. a idea I had and I had no idea if it was going to work but I was too scared to tell anyone how unconfident I was until I modeled it. Um, but uh, yeah, it ended up, ended up working really nicely. It works super, super well, except when people try and shoot the ball. Yeah. <laughs> the uh, behavior of the wasps is uh, sort of mesmerizing in a way. Oh, I love it. It's like, it's like a fluid dynamic. Um, yeah. You get enough enemies on the screen and they just, they just move like a pattern. Interestingly enough, in our speedrunning community, they regard Vespula as the hardest boss because there's the most chance for things to go wrong, which I think is really great that this early boss can cause the best players in the world so much pain just because of the nature of her 
style of Chaotic Attack. She's not the hardest boss to, to defeat, but she is the hardest to consistently perfect. And that's kind of unique. She also has some really great dialogue. I like Vespula's dialogue. I like the, the boss dialogue in general. We, we don't talk about that enough that each of the bosses has like a really strong connection to the different androids and gets their own point across I kinda, depending on who you're playing. I kind of like the idea that like Embryo is a bit of a bully and you kind of feel alright about taking him down but Vespula's a, got a hint of tragic to her that you're supposed to kind of be like oh you don't don't feel super super great about how things came out. Mm. Well also there's a backstory between uh, Vespula and uh, is it Lemon? I yeah think? yeah. Yeah and so like where in there were times when they were buddies yeah, right? yeah, and, and yeah, it's, Vespula was her mentor. So yeah, it's like the, yeah. So there's this uh, uh, in the dialogue, you can you can see a bit of that in there. Ah, uh, checkpoint. The best idea I never had. This is such a cool level, Tim. Yeah, this, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, this. This was a really important uh, switch up, I think. This, mm. We got to the point of the game where, we, where it felt really important to show a different type of gameplay and something that they had never seen before. Mm. And the moving through the ship now, like, is is was such a huge step. Seemingly simple, but yeah, you know, it's conceptually just another uh, another uh, arena. But yeah, it's, yeah, it's like the arena is moving around the player, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's cool. Um, always had trouble with understanding how this level would work before we actually built it because if you're moving through the level then how do we encourage you to defeat the enemies how do we box you in how do we get the battery going well but it just works so well it's so much fun i think if the whole game was like this it would feel tiring and just not very interesting but as a one-off or a two-off across the campaign it's brilliant yeah it's it's one i'm pretty sure that the seams would show if you if you tried to do it too much, but as a palette palette refresher, it's it works really well. <laughs> always always liked how you made the uh, wall lights uh, react to the music. Yeah, yeah. Some some people don't realize, but they're they're literally bouncing off Jeff's music. It's not it's not like pre canned or anything like that. It's like a frequency analysis or something, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Although if you turn off the music, it does do some random I, Yeah, I, I just have to sample pearl and noise because I no longer have a, uh, an audio stream to <laughs> work off. Yes. Automation, what a great track. It's just so relentless. It, uh, for me, it was, uh, I, I quite like that song. It's a part, I'm partial to it and it's, uh, there's sort of a danceiness to it. Um, but it, I feel it ties in with the aesthetic of, of the world as well. You know, with, uh, it was almost like a nightclub vibe going on. Mm. I think yeah. the entire Zone 3 has that feel to it, that go, go, go. It's very movement oriented in all the levels as well. Yeah. So this is Transit, uh, set on a moving train, uh, which is uh, just like Descent. It's the second time we had a, a small gameplay space set, on a, set against a moving background, but I was particularly proud of this level. Um, there's a lot of detail going into the track work and the, the train itself. I always thought the turns were the interesting part for this level. The, the train itself and the track work is pretty cool, but the way that it interacts and confuses you and tricks you, and this is a common theme with a lot of my comments across the, the commentary now, but surprising people is always good. And this level surprises a lot of people when it twists and it turns and they get pushed around. Mm. The, the, the way the perspective changes with the camera rotating and stuff. Yeah, like I love that first turn. It feels like it's just being interesting, but it's actually setting up the laser sweeping. Mm. Uh, it's a very functional um, kind of setup. I really hope people have figured out how to weapon swap dodge by <laughs> now because a lot of people don't figure that out by now, and then the laser comes and they don't know what to do. And even though there's two solutions, you can weapon swap dodge through it, or you can stand behind an enemy and, and let them tank the laser. I, a lot of people uh, just don't figure out either of those, and I'm a bit sorry for that, that I, I don't convey things better, but 
I think when you do know or figure out those strategies, it's one of the most interesting and fun parts of any level across the game. You can also stand behind the crates, but then we remove the crate that you're standing closest to. That's where the next enemy spawns out of. Uh, which I always liked because it's got that sense of at the start you can just stand behind any crate but by the end there's only one crate left. Uh, what's in the crate? What's in the crate? <laughs> <laughs> which you'll find out shortly, I'm sure. I didn't know that. I'm glad you mentioned that. I don't know. I'm not going to change the way I play now. <laughs> yeah, you can actually you can actually t uh, you do it strategically by standing next to a crate that you're most okay about losing. Mm. You can tell that Tim was the primary uh, idea man behind this level because again, it's got multiple waves with just bombs. Bombs are great. Everyone loves bombs. I put the uh, bomb tanks in as a joke, but nobody stopped me, so they made it into the, the full game. <laughs> bomb tanks are great. You won't see those for several levels though. For now, just regular wasp tanks. And lasers! I love lasers. I forgot to mention this in... I like, Checkpoint. I like how the firepower upgrade protects you from the lasers if the if the little drones caught the laser. Yeah, that was like a that was a total lucky accident that I kind of uh, made sure it's, it worked throughout the game. Mm. Uh, it saved me a few times for sure. <laughs> They're your little buddies. Look, they've got yeah. like cute faces and they do neat things. I, I love the firepower drones, especially if you finish a level. And you have them, mm. and they just chill out there, and they do their thing, and they spin around. Yeah, Fire power drones are great. Yeah, they actually have like uh, special behavior because uh, normally they just float next to you, but if you finish the stage with them, they actually have a little bit of drift animation, and uh, they're triggering off their uh, their idle animation, so they look more interesting. The more you know. So here's a level that not a lot of people are going to talk about loving because it's kind of evil. <laughs> Heat. I'm super proud of this level though, despite people hating it. They hate it for all the right reasons. That's because it's mean. It's mean all well, you the put, way. You put all this stuff in there that looks like, oh, that's a little safe spot. Oh, no, it isn't. <laughs> and oh, this is safe in here. No, it's not safe. Well, here. yeah, there's, <laughs> it, it teaches an important lesson. There is no safe spots. Mm. No, there is no safety, this but is a, it's this much is an unsafe game. It's much safer than it ever was in the early stages. I remember the first version of this level, where we didn't have this open middle section. Like there was a pathway, but it was closed off at the edges, and it was almost impossible to escape death when the fire was coming for you. But now, now with the, the open section, it's good and. We also do a lot of changes now as well with the fire turning off, moving fast, moving slow, mm -hmm. double fire, all that kind of good stuff. I feel like the thing nobody notices in this level is the, my, all my pixel art on the walls. It has, uh, I do little fire animations, but the, the, uh, the animations tell you what's going on. So when the fire's regular side up, it's telling you it's coming out one of the burners, and when the fire goes upside down, it's coming out the other burner. And when, it gets, when the fire gets really huge, it's coming out both burners. And then during the point where it stops, you get uh, cooling written on the wall. So it's kind of it's it's helping you out, but nobody notices. No, that yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I noticed eventually, <laughs> <laughs> even though I worked on the game. But you know, other people probably notice more than me. An early version of the game when it does a, a it does a quick uh, spin around at one point, and um, with bombs dropping, and an early early version actually kept spinning around fast until all of the bombs were gone, which meant if one bomb managed to escape and get into a relatively safe spot, it could just spin around over and over again. We fixed that. One of the more interesting things about this level on speedrunning versus score attack is that if you're running this level for speed, you can kind of make use of the fire. I think there's a couple levels that are like this with red damage where uh, you sometimes want to let the red attacks which damage both players and enemies on like blue and yellow attacks. Um, actually do the work for you. Whereas if you're score attacking, you want every kill, so you need to try and fight against it. So there's a nice little divide there in what your goal is and how you have to play. So this is Revolution. Um, this was another level that was prototyped very early on. This is kind of the first idea for a moving level that would have uh, parts that would rotate around itself. And it's kind of, I've always thought of it as a really visually interesting level. It's so much is going on. Hey, it's got more pixel art that people probably won't notice. Lots of it. 
<laughs> you've got the arrows on the side that show you which direction they're going. I think they, they change speed as well, right? Yeah, Based yeah. On they, the rotation they've got a bunch speed. of... They, they change... They scroll and animate between different states. If only this game wasn't moving at a million miles an hour. People <laughs> might notice these things, but I think it looks cool. This is one of my favorite levels for the fact that it has so many lasers. Any level with a lot of lasers is just awesome in my book. Yeah, I really like the way the laser plays with the rotating blockers, so you get this kind of strange lasers shooting out at odd angles gameplay. How many people do you think actually ride the circle around, as I sort of intended when I was designing some of this gameplay? It's, it's kind of hard, like I, I feel like sometimes it feels like your friend, but a lot of the times it just feels like a frustration, which is, which is a shame, because it would be nice if it was it was more practical, I think. Yeah, I remember in the early prototypes, the uh, blockers on the, the end were full length of <laughs> the rotational area, so you couldn't walk past them. Um, and it made the spinning a lot more of your enemy than your friend. Uh, now you can kind of use it. I use it personally. I, I use the accelerate and I spin around with it and avoid all of the things that can hurt me, but yeah. It, it, I think it, it's a bit 50-50 in terms of how people view the spinning. The Accelerate actually reduces the damage you take, doesn't it? Hmm. Yeah, the Accelerate will give you a sort of evasion on damage input yeah. because you're moving so fast that... You can easily collect bullets, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So to compensate, it, it actually like ignores every third point of damage. Yeah, it's yeah. a good thing. It's a fairly essential power-up if you're trying to play recklessly and also early on if you're trying to collect all the pickups to get a higher weapon level since it will suck in everything. Yeah. But later on you may want to prioritize a little bit more things like firepower if you're going for just pure scoring. I really like the way the three power-ups play off each other and there's never a best power-up overall. There's only the best power-up for this moment in this situation, in this exact uh, scenario. Yeah, I'm really proud that none of the power-ups lost their relevance at any time. Like, at times it's a good strategy to do something, but it's never, it's never the wrong strategy in the end. Same with the characters to some degree. They all kind of work well and play off against each other across the campaign. Right, so this is Justice. Um, I really like this level. Um, this boss is voiced by Tim, if I remember. Yep. And uh, that was a lot of fun to do. <laughs> um, Music-wise, almost like a circus or something, or, or uh, I don't know. I, definitely, I was thinking deranged robot. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and I, I re always liked the um, the way the fence post mechanics worked, and that you could like, you know, they you could take them out, and and it was to your advantage to take them out, but obviously, and if, if you got distracted by everything else, then, and you didn't take care of the, the fence posts, the, uh, you'd just end up in this hell grid. I think this was the most nerfed boss throughout development. He's a, yeah, he's a tricky one. He, he deliberately has this kind of three phase structure and his first phase is very defensive, which I think just made him like a, un reachable wall for a lot of players. In some ways I'd actually describe this boss as a as one of the few pseudo failures of, of how I thought about things because the three phases, while they're interesting and they're different from any of the other bosses, they're so hard for people to get used to. This idea that you need to fight through a whole phase just to get a new battery, uh, it just seems so alien to people. and. That's why I guess we didn't do it again, even though we made it work here with Justice. It just took so long to gradually refine him and refine his difficulty and his attacks. Remember the first version, which I could S plus quite comfortably because I understood the design of the, the three phase structure. Uh, he fired like twice as many capture balls, twice as often. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, I, I really liked how thematically he ended up being all about uh, containment and, and um, imprisoning, because it fits very well with his character, but yeah, he was a little bit overboard. Yeah, brutal, brutal boss, but also one of 
the most visually spectacular. And as Jeff said, he's got like this crazy circus intensity music thing going on, which I really dig as well. I think my favorite element was that, that people probably don't notice is that uh, in his final phase, when he, he uh, chest beams you, uh, his head switches to a skull. Also, uh, a lot of people line. don't even notice he throws his head at you and replaces <laughs> it. <laughs> Grows a new one, yeah. <laughs> Which is a cool little trick. He has multiple heads, apparently. They each do a different thing. Alright, we're moved into World 4. And the game is getting pretty deep by now. You've unlocked a bunch of characters. I really, really hope people play the different characters. I think that they do, based on anecdotal evidence of watching them play in leaderboards and things, but I, I really hope they try Shitake anyway, because she's so much fun. Um, this those, level was... Oh, sorry. I was just going to say, those mines are just really fun to, to play with, and laying them in the right spot and having the enemy walk into them and just mm. feels really, really good. Yeah, she's probably one of the most tactile characters to play as that mm. sensation of every shot just feels so strong yeah especially when you line up a whole lot a whole lack of uh, uh, robots all in a row I really I really like this level it's one of the it's one of the larger levels and it feels it feels like it's almost one of the most representational levels in the game where you get a big mix of enemy types a lot going on the levels constantly shifting but you kind of can really cut loose. It also has a very simple concept that ends up in a lot of complex situations, which is a hallmark of the better levels in the game for me. Uh, so the platforms that are shifting out are just kind of ones that aren't near you, so they're not going to cause them the most... They have no enemies, you're not on them, that kind of thing. Um, so you can actually control which platforms drop away and which ones fall in if you're paying really, really close attention. But by having this simple nature of how they react like that and then having a lot of variance in the type of platforms that can change, I find that it creates enough chaos that it's really exciting all the time. Um, so I, I like that about it too. I find uh, World, World 4, which is set outside the ship, is one of the most uh, interesting visually, probably the most ambitious worlds, I think, which is kind of cool. Like. It feels like you've worked up to this epic. You can see the ship in the background. You can see the stars at times. Um, it's a really nice feel compared to the, you know, from going from inside to outside. Mm. I know in the in the music, I, I tried to really push the sci-fi sound of it, um, and thinking about being you know, floating around in outer space. Certainly, at the beginning part of the song, just makes me think that. I think the World 4 music is my favorite stage music and second favorite track of the entire game behind Little Android, which just makes me crack up every time I hear it. <laughs> I, the first, whenever you watch anybody play the game, I like guess somebody picked it up and they're streaming and they don't know me. It's somebody who has no connection to me and they play it and I watch and eventually they get to a stage that's too hard and they die. And they put the controller down for 20 seconds and it starts singing at them about you know, not feeling their face or their fingers and, and different things. That is a golden moment. <laughs> it's it's pretty good. It sneaks up on people because uh, because it takes so long for the vocal to come in. Yeah. So they just think it's just yeah, sort of yeah. moody music. Well, they'll, they'll miss know? it the first few times. Yeah, yeah like like Matt says, it's only when yeah. they when they sit to it. Mm -hmm. I love the uh, the the art style of this whole world is actually based on um, uh, space stations and uh, solar panels and stuff mm -hmm. like that. You know, keeping that orange theme because each each world has its own color palette. But I was really proud of how this one managed to kind of uh, channel some of that kind of uh, International Space Station imagery mm. in its own way. Mm. I think it's great. It's hard to use orangey brown and make a cool looking your art style, but <laughs> it works really well here. So this is Relay, the second, uh, the second moving level in the game alongside uh, uh, Checkpoint. And uh, it's it's kind of cool, like I liked that we got to revisit the concept and I liked that we got to revisit it in a different way. You know, ch uh, checkpoint is enclosed and you're running through corridors and this is like you're just floating in the middle of nowhere. Uh, you can see the panel snapping off behind you, it really feels like you're in a perilous situation, uh, even though mechanically it's pretty similar. Yes, yeah, snapping off behind you, not at all the same as when the doors close. I can tell you, technically it's totally different. <laughs> I promise. <laughs> Believe me. 
but yeah, it works pretty well. I actually think this level's a good example of why this style of gameplay wouldn't work across the entire game, because by the end of the level it is starting to feel a little bit tired, but it's also refreshing and entertaining that it comes back and you get to, to do it again, so I, I really liked it, I thought it worked out well. Um, and also because I did the design of this one, so obviously it's the best. <laughs> That's how I qualify the different level qualities, by the way. This is an interesting level. You're, you're literally moving across the ship. You can see, depending on uh, how far you move, you can see more or less of the spaceship, which was actually really hard to line up because uh, at times, if you got it wrong, you'd end up half embedded in the ship. I remember how much care and attention you put into the design of the different areas that you go through and the ship and trying to keep the whole concept together and then we get to world 4 and you actually get to see huge chunks of it in the background and I think the sense of place helps I certainly hope people get a sense that they're on a real place and that as they travel through each level it, that they're progressing somewhere so I think yeah this was a really cool level because you get to move so far and you get to see so much that it works I think that's, that's a cool aspect of Cactus in general is that like on the surface you know it's a twin stick shooter and there's enemies and you shoot them that's that's that there's and the levels have this cool look and stuff but the the that if you look into it there's a lot of depth uh, and backstory and everything from the level select to like you know this this particular world and how we're outside of the ship everything is linked and everything ties into each other with the, the game design the backstory the level design the characters their purpose, you know what I mean? It's all, uh, it's all very well thought out and, uh, and everything's connected and has a, a purpose. And uh, yeah, I, I think uh, Timmy did a good job figuring all this out. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting, like everything is in the surface of game, is in the surface of gameplay. Like everything is about making the game feel and play right. But at the same time, it was really important to me that the game could be something people could love like mm. that if you dug into it if you if you thought about why the levels were that way that you'd yeah. find something interesting and not just be like a well we do it that way yeah yep and I love that I feel like I feel like we managed to between the three of us we managed to do that across every facet of the game mm -hmm. um, I think that's I think that's really cool yeah I can definitely feel that in the design of the world there's always a little bit more than you expect when it comes to the lore or the setting or the mm. sense of place or the music with its different layers and I hope people feel it with the gameplay as well with some of the character balancing and the designs and the interactions that are there. And even some of the level, the, the enemy, enemy waves, like a lot of, there's a lot of thought I know you put into uh, combining certain enemies with other enemies to give specific feelings. Yeah, the, the, the combination of enemies, I think there was a great talk at at one of the conferences once on how they combined very few enemies in in some of the classic arcade shmups to create a huge array of experiences and we tried to do as much of that as we could where if you're very conscious about matching the blue toaster dogs with the laser enemies and you get gripped but you can't move it creates such a different sense of pace and feel to some of the other gameplay styles so I, I really do hope that people like that. Ah, Focus, the level that was originally meant to be giant panes of glass, but I think it's actually kind of cooler the way it is now. Uh, landing down on these big discs that shatter away and you fall down. You totally fall, by the way. None of this is faked, I can guarantee it. Just like I guaranteed <laughs> everything about the other level. Trust me, I'm a doctor. <laughs> I'm not a doctor. Uh, yeah, the, I like. I really like the layout of this level. Like, um, effectively, you're just moving from a smaller game play, uh, game space to a larger game space over time. But it has a lot of lot of character and and really benefits from being outside as well. You get to see, you get to to see you're getting close to the ship every time you fall down. Yeah, you're moving down. You're crashing things out. It, it's got that real nice sense of progression that we tried to do across the game. For me, I, I love the way the pillars are kind of moving down with you and creating this different play space. They're not there at first, and then you fall down and there, and then it crashes away and they fall with you. 
Um, getting that all to work properly and play well with the different enemy waves was a little bit challenging, but it works really well. And also, this level introduces more lasers. I don't know if you know this, but I love lasers. Is this the level where you introdu introduced reapers, or were they...? This is the reaper level. This is the level where I originally had three times as many Reapers, <laughs> and then the initial people that played the game got very angry with me. This is a, th a theme, I feel like, at this point. Mm. This level also has the blue toaster dogs with their little um, laser uh, leash thing. Yeah, the friendly uh, ones. Makes, makes me very the angry. The only enemies in the game that can't actually hurt you, but people really, really hate them. If they you, do. I'm trying to remember if there's a, a way you can avoid their their Tractor beam you or, can run behind right, a or, pillar if you break line of sight. Yeah, that's it. And if it, and, and I've made them growl. With, <laughs> if, it's really hard to hear the growling amongst all the chaos of the level. But yeah, they give you a little. A Why little would you growl. do that to them? They're trying their best. <laughs> Occasionally, people can hear the evil, sinister laugh of oh, the Reaper great. enemies. Of the too. Reaper, yeah, yeah. I, I've talked to people who thought they were imagining it, and it yeah, was yeah, so yeah. good. Yeah, yeah. I've tried to keep it subtle, but yeah. No, it worked so well. Mm -hmm. There's so many nice little touches like that where like Tim's pixel art in the earlier levels and here you're slightly creepy audio <laughs> coming in that people aren't sure what we, what exactly is happening. Mm. It's quite lovely. This is uh, this is the only level that uses a blue flamethrower as well, which was um, needed because to stop it murdering all your enemies. Yeah, when it was a red flamethrower at first, it was killing all the wasps and making the level super easy. <laughs> So I uh, obviously had to change that, keep things on the up and up. But it's an interesting point of contention. A lot of people think that the blue flame is unavoidable. Um, or, yeah, they kind of get a bit salty about it. Just move around, dodge <laughs> through and do something. <laughs> I hate to use it, but get good. Ah, Repeater. This is one of my kind of uh, pet levels. Um, it's very indulgent, technically. Uh, it's reconstructing itself as you're playing with with surprisingly little trickery. It's actually reassembling physics as you're moving around and trying to build a, a pathway between you and w where the enemies are and everything else. Yeah, when Tim tells you something is really real, he means it unlike me, so you can believe him. <laughs> well, the whole game is smoke and mirrors. That's the whole point. Like, you know, good games make you feel like you're doing things that you know, much more complicated things than you are. But this level really is doing <laughs> horribly complicated things. <laughs> Each of those blocks can transform both into tiles and also those um, those wall blocks, which is kind of interesting. Um, they kind of unfold and, and then spread apart and reveal little canvas inners. Oh, it's so brutal. Yeah, it was a horrible level to balance because, well, you can't. <laughs> I remember the doing the audio for it was a bit of a head scratcher too, because each of those things trying to trigger sounds and stuff like that, trying to uh, you know, do it in a way that's somehow supportive and intuitive, you know. But um, yeah, not sound like yeah, not sounding like someone dropping a bunch of um, you know, transformers down some stairs. Yeah, yeah, it was tricky. <laughs> what's the what's the logic behind what it's creating, uh, like the path that it's creating? So it uses a whole bunch of things. The main one is it takes your position and your velocity, so it tries to put the blocks ahead of where you're trying to move. Right. So as you're running around, it's kind of trying to trying to put the blocks where you're going. But also yeah, I've noticed that when I when I play it, it's like I feel like oh I want to go there, and if you push in that direction, it it builds the floor in that direction. Yeah. So it's kind of helping you out, but yeah. also. Also but, restricting you. <laughs> yeah, because it puts those uh, those sort of box things in the way. Sometimes it can end up being extremely brutal, though, if it, if it decides that it wants to build a wall somewhere and you don't want the wall to be there. Yeah. But it's just going to build it anyway. Yeah, especially yeah. when you're trying to S plus this one. It actually switches between a few different template patterns throughout the level. Like, so there's a period where it starts building these kind of um, uh, tetra block shapes that you have to, to maneuver through, and they're quite interesting to dodge when bombs are falling. And then uh, in a later part of the level it starts, it, it just stops building walls and just builds flat. So if you, if you run out, you'll actually get into a big flat area. Uh, but if you, stay in the, if you stay in the walled area, they'll stick around. So it's kind of, you have a lot of control over what the level's going to be. I like that about these dynamic levels when they do that, where 
if you're paying attention to how the level reacts to what you do, you can control it. So it's less about you dealing with its change and more about you creating the change that you want it to make. Mm. Like a big rule for the whole game was to try to keep everything procedural and uh, deterministic. So it's based off your actions. So if you get a really like disadvantage, uh, uh, yeah, if you get a really bad level shape, it's kind of your fault. <laughs> no, I think a lot of people don't realize that when they play that based on not just this level and its shape that it's making, but also the enemy waves, uh, where they spawn, that kind of thing. They're all based on your position, what you're doing, who you're defeating, the timing of when you defeat them. Uh, a lot of things like that that are actually under your control. And as you see the players get more and more experienced, um, one of the, the coolest things that I ever saw was when the speedrunners worked out that if they defeat Embryo's waves at just the right time, just the right milliseconds, they can get the right power-ups and cut 20-30 seconds off the boss fight and then they can try and do that to some degree in the regular levels as well. It's really, really mm. cool. It's like everything seems chaotic and terrible and geared against you, but you actually have control. It's a, it's a metaphor for life. <laughs> That's deep. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Venom. So this is voiced by you, Nart, isn't it? It is. It's my best impersonation of a super creepy giant spider robot that wants to destroy you. Mm. It, we, we were contractually obligated to add a giant spider to the game because we're a video game. And also Australian. Yes. I mean, he's a little bit small compared to the ones I see in my backyard, but he'll grow up. He'll get there. One of the few instances of true bullet hell in the game I would, I would describe him as. A lot of the earlier stuff, like Embryo and some of the levels even, are very soft, but Venom doesn't mess around. Every pattern, every wave is just the brutal way up. You know, huge amounts of bullets on screen, hundreds. Mm. I think you can get it up to a thousand in, in one of the waves, and mm. it's just absurd. Yeah, I really like wanted to get... Um, I really wanted to play with scale for, for Venom and make him feel like the largest boss. Like, he's so large, he can't even interact with you. And, uh, some of his phases, too, are... had to be nerfed quite hard, but also... <laughs> then had to be brought back and, and changed quite drastically. I, I learned a lot of lessons about bullet hell uh, based on the first version of this boss that we spent a lot of time on and I felt really bad because the concepts we were using were just not strong enough uh, in the early versions. A lot of the bullet patterns were based on sheer number of bullets rather than kind of coalescing them together. Um, and in the future revisions, like the version that people play now, he f actually fires more bullets, I think, than the earlier unnerfed version, but they're all together and create these really easily visible lines and patterns and circles that you can dodge and weave between. Uh, so learning about all that was really tricky for this novel. Is there anything, uh, any favorite moment in particular for you, Tim? Um, I mean, I yeah, I mean, I really, I really like when he gets up close enough to to start, you know. Uh, hooking his way up into the stage and firing his butt cannon. <laughs> yeah, I actually, I actually quite like when, when the uh, the other way where where because he's so big, the camera has to, and the the camera has to zoom out really far, and your character gets really small. It just makes everything seem massive. Uh, I like that. I can't that go part. past the moment where the drill pump comes up and plunges through the uh, <laughs> the ground and just sprays out a thousand bullets in a giant spiral. That, that's got to be one of the most iconic moments in the entire game. One of the, the funnier sound design things I had to do here was um, choose the appropriate fart sounds for the butt cannon. <laughs> so yes, there is fart sounds in there. Good job, Jeff. <laughs> the sacrifices that you've made. Well, you know, I now know that I have like 200 different fart sounds in my library. <laughs> The interesting thing is, uh, is Venom has eight phases because he's a spider, and it just seemed. Uh, but he 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 loses multiple legs in a couple of phases, mm -hmm. so he mm -hmm. has two phases that aren't leg related. Uh. Um, but it was important to keep the eight. I'm all about themes. 
Also, by having a large number of phases, we have the reverse situation of justice, where now you can actually kind of shorten the phases and make them more intense and exciting and difficult in other ways, which mm. was a fun switch up. But Venom was also a really interesting point for the storytelling. Um, mm. Like the game doesn't have the most complicated story, but we were kind of leading you to, to Venom mm. as, as the instigator. And it's the, it's the, the time and, when we actually uh, yeah, work in a work in a plot twist, which is pretty and cool. yeah, quite uh, possibly the the most sinister moment there <laughs> in the uh, in the whole game. Yeah, it's a very fun introduction of a fun character that players are about to meet. And they had no I, no real idea about aside from the tiny hints the previous bosses all dropped about greater things at work. So Centrifuge is our first uh, intro until World 5 and I really like this level actually. It's kind of a, it's a meat grinder of a level and it's just all about throwing huge amounts of enemies at you <laughs> and making you deal with them. It, it's always felt to me like the most uh, sort of traditional wave based level to me, you know? Like because you can, uh, I remember feeling like I could memorize the patterns or I felt they were more, a little more predictable, predictable than some of the other levels. It's also the first time the game is really that clean traditional sci-fi in both the visual aesthetic and also the music for this world I think is, is very much in that, that tone where the rest of the game is kind of more eclectic. Mm. Um, which I think is a fun change up that we take until now to go back to yes we can do the traditional style really well as well. In general, each of the world, each of the first levels of a world, we've tried to give you a level where you can cut loose a bit. So you have to go from hive to um, uh, uh, checkpoint to assembly and to centrifuge. And it's kind of it's a it's a way of to try out the new character. Mm. <laughs> this one's quite fun. fun to play with uh, Peanut. And uh, when you first do that thing where you uh, um, do the drill. Um, along the edge and, do this, and just do circles. That's yeah. quite fun to do. <laughs> was that a bug or was that intentional when it first went uh, in? I can't remember. It was. It was technically like it was an impl It was a implication of the rules that I realized. Like, oh, if I say that if you can go along a, a wall, it'll correct your trajectory. That means you're going to be able to go around in circles. And then I la in increased the threshold to make it more viable. Yeah, I, I recall that exact moment because it was awesome and <laughs> we wanted it to happen more. <laughs> but when it first happened, it was very shocking. <laughs> yeah, and we, we, I remember like kind of sitting there going, uh, is this gonna break the game? And we can kind of conclude it wasn't, so it was fine. Yeah, it's fine, it's fine. Peanut as well is, I think she's one of the most interesting characters in the game. I use this word a lot interesting, but I think she's genuinely unique and cool across all the characters because her secondary is so mobility focused. It's not just about damage, in fact a lot of it isn't even damage. When you pin a character and you move them across you don't damage them until you hit a wall so the most efficient way is often to drill an enemy right against the wall. But you're invulnerable and you damage smaller enemies along your path so if you can drill someone across the entire stage you can drastically change the situation that you're in. And I just really, really love that about Peanut. I just, yeah, I, I mean, I, I, this this level was themed around um, the Gravitrons from, um, you know, uh, the sh uh, shows and that mm, kind of thing, mm. and like that whole spinning thing. I just, I don't know, I, I, I really liked it. Mm. I, I considered at one point spinning the camera as well, and I realized that that would make you It's a lot of that, <laughs> avoiding that. <laughs> Probably for the best. So control, there's something I really like about this level. Um, when I first tried it out, um, I, I found myself sort of becoming obsessed with using the little helper devices <laughs> and uh, trying to figure out the best sequence in which to use them and enable them. And I've, every, job, every time I play it, I have my, my pattern that I go to. I don't think it actually is a very good thing in terms of score chasing or anything, but it, it's just uh, the... It, it feels so empowering when you when you enable these things and you, you're able to cause a lot more damage when, when using them. 
Yeah, they're super fun. Especially activating the machine gun, which keeps going even after you leave. Mm. Right, that is one of the most satisfying things across the entire game. It's just that moment where you step on it, you step off, and it's just shooting things for you. Yeah, it's the, it's the only game, it's the only level where you get to use the stage hazards against your enemies. They're all there just for you. They can't hurt you in any way. Unlike, you know, Revolution, where the spinning can be a helper, but also a hindrance just as much. Yeah, that's it. I really like that it come, comes in so late in the game as well. Like, you know, you're heading to the home stretch, and it's just a way of, of mixing it up again. You know, this was the only level that uh, we actually put out in, in the game's um, beta and had to remove and rebuild completely because I was so unhappy with the original design I had for it. But the redesign just works so well, I'm really, really glad we took the time to do that. The first design was a lot simpler, it didn't have these um, these helper bots that would shoot for you, instead it had different layouts that you could trigger based on walking over switches, but essentially you'd find a layout that worked best for your playstyle and your character and then just stick to that the entire time, so my desire to give people options and create enemy waves that were better suited for using the different power, uh, different layout switches just never worked out. Whereas these helper bots, they're just great. They pop up, they shoot you, they do different things, so they all have unique purpose and useful. And as Jeff said, he has his style of how he uses them, and it might not be the most efficient, but it's like the way he wants to use them. Mm. And the way the cooldowns are designed to kind of push you around the level a bit, so, you know, if you want to make use of all of them, you'll want to move between them at different points. Which, yeah, it's always a good thing. <laughs> it's good with the uh, accelerate power up because you can fly around and activate them all. And that was maximum damage. I think which character you play has a big impact on how you experience this level too. I, I personally like to play Peanut because she has that mobility on top of the, the accelerate. So even if you don't have it, you can still get from one you know, area to another. But uh, yeah, it's just very, very interesting it's a different style. Convection is a really interesting level because I uh, had to learn uh, a bit more about how the level design or how the level uh, functions, like it, from a technical point of view, and learn how Nart and Tim uh, put these levels together. Uh, because I wanted the sound to trigger uh, on the um, when the the flaming pads uh, light up. And it was really interesting, uh, as uh, Nart mentioned earlier, with the um, uh, pixel grid. Uh, basically, uh, you know, you, you use the, um, I remember it was like a, it was a, what program do we use? Like a painting program or something like that to, to change the, the, the color of a, of a pixel would, would uh, define whether, what state a block was in. I remember, right? Something like that. Yeah, you could and paint in how long it was going to take for it to light up, how lo how long it would stay lit up for, and all that kind of. Information. Yeah, it was. I, f I found the system really interesting, and uh, and then having to you know w work that into the audio triggers, uh, and then again uh, you know trying to make it so that we didn't trigger too many sounds all at once, because uh, <laughs> obviously the machine and the level has the ability to just trigger hundreds of sounds at once and just trying to make it uh, sort of smart. Uh, and then the, the level itself is so incredibly tricky because <laughs> yeah. of these flaming things chasing you, especially the ones where it's, it lights up wherever you go. That one's especially uh, hair raising. I'm really glad you took the time to handcraft the audio for all the fire throughout this level though because when it when we were thinking about automated systems it could have sounded semi-correct but the way it sounds when you play the level now the fire races from left to right it circles around you there's that real sense of positional audio that comes through uh that just adds a ton to the the feel of the level so all during uh during development in white box uh, this level had uh um kind of giant red jello cubes <laughs> that would come out of the ground to represent the fire and in my mind, they, the level always looked like this. This was the thing, like, whenever I was playing the white box levels, they always looked like the final game to me. I just, I was just filming in the art as I went. But I think there was some tangible disappointment when the jello cubes went away. 
I love the jello cubes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I hand animated those jello cubes and took me about 30 seconds and it was great. It's interesting that there's uh, a lot of the early access version uh, of the game on YouTube and stuff and you can you can watch <laughs> you know how you know the the way these levels used to be when we were developing the game and uh, how uh, how much of it has stayed true to the white box and that it's you know um, you know effectively the um, towards the end it was a, a, an aesthetic pass that we did to finish it off but it still plays the same yeah uh, one of the things I love about the the pixel art approach to timing everything is that, that, that Nart was able to get this kind of real choreographed uh, dance performance feel to the level. Like when the burners come on en, ma en masse and they just sweep across the level and it's like fast and violent and it's, yeah, just spectacular. It really does just kind of consume you at different points, especially when it starts firing underneath you and you're running away from your own shadow essentially while having to deal with the huge flaming uh, circles that are spiraling out everywhere and there's just so much chaos happening but it's all still under your control um, it's pretty cool and uh, the other thing that, that's interesting about this level to me was that like many of the levels it became more playable not less as we added graphics and I think that was an interesting goal for the game uh, as well, that every time we added new graphics to the game it was to enhance the way that you played it rather than to detract or overpower you. Yeah, so much of the art was built around visibility and uh, uh, information. Um, yeah, we really wanted to let you know what was going on. Collider. So this is one of the most divergent levels in the game and I'm really proud of that part. Uh, we introduce, a, we introduce an, another android that you're facing off against, but you don't even fight her to start with. Um, it, was a, it was a really nice way of kind of bringing things full circle, I think. This level is the bane of many people's existence. And I don't think it's unfair to say most people would describe this as possibly the hardest level in the entire game, despite the fact that they might spend longer trying to defeat Medulla because She's just so brutal, and right. the level itself is so brutal. I remember actively asking you guys to make it easier because I was I was <laughs> finding it so frustrating to get through this level. I think when, especially when I was trying to S plus it, you know, because that is really really tricky. I feel like uh, uh, Licorice has some of the well, like one of my favorite tracks in the game as well. Oh uh, yeah, yeah. It's because uh, uh, to me it's like uh, it gets really, I don't know, for the lack of a better word, really video gamey there with the, and, and I wanted the guitars to um, be a sort of a this sound of her strength, her power, you know? <laughs> yeah, it comes in really, really well in that semi-boss track style. It's mm. actually a unique track as well because across the game we have whole tracks, boss tracks, which are progressive tracks, and the dynamic tracks, but Licorice is this kind of segmented whole track experience, so I really like that she has her own flavor, her own mm. uh, dynamics that go on there, and the track itself is just killer. It's, yeah, definitely one of my favorites. I, we always, I always had this goal of trying to make uh, Licorice work as both a enemy and a playable character, and during development it was so scary, like, we had contingency plans for if it didn't work out. But in my mind, I, I knew how I wanted it to feel and what I wanted to capture with it. Um, yeah, there were many, many risks associated with this semi-boss battle. The idea of essentially playing a PvP against the AI and making it work, making it fun. Um, especially because we did a lot of early testing on actual PvP and it was terrible. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, not the best, uh, which, which is a big part of why you're fighting uh, Licorice among other robots, and so it's a, it's a um, resource war, not a, not, you're not trying to beat Licorice, you're trying to outplay it. And I think that leads to some of the more diverse endings to a level as well, because it can actually last <laughs> an infinite amount of time, so long as you're both getting batteries. It's entirely down to battery control, and 
no sense of destruction on either player. Yeah, it's it's so good though. I, I like it's almost teaching people that androids are scary. Like for the first time, you understand what it's like to have an enemy that just doesn't doesn't like stop when you knock them down. Uh, when Licorice grabs the first battery from you, <laughs> and you realize that she can collect the batteries, mm. that is terrifying. That is mm. the, the darkest moment of the entire campaign. It's so good. I, yeah, I love that we were able to do everything so genuinely. She's able, she takes, she powers up her main weapon using weapon orbs. She takes power-ups and she has to keep battery to, to survive. Mm -hmm. But it's still totally fair. That's the important thing about, like, when I talk about the difficulty of this game a lot, I talk about people getting angry or you know, upset at things, but they tend to stick with it and want to defeat it because the game is never cheating you and Licorice never cheats you. In fact, if anything, some of the secret mechanics that work behind the scenes allow you to cheat Licorice a little bit when you're fighting over the same battery. It's slightly stacked in your favor, but yeah. But And, and, and she moves around, she plays just like her player, player avatar um, counterpart. She's not doing anything too different. Mm. And I think and that's I, important, that, that fairness. Mm. Her, uh, her cool special ability at the end to uh, when she's finally taken out by her battery running out that she grabs one last bit of power by destroying all the robots at the end there. There's, a, there's an interesting yeah. thing, the amount of battery she, emergency battery she, re, she restores is actually based on how many enemies are on the screen. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Medulla. Now, I suppose I had every opportunity to be the voice of Medulla as the audio guy on the team, but we uh, decided to have my daughter Ella be, be the voice. Uh, and uh, yeah, I thought she did a great job. We, we put a lot of processing on her voice, so she doesn't really sound like herself. But um, yeah, it was such a, a cool uh, opportunity to um, revisit all the other bosses uh, and uh, re-say their lines, but she's she says the same dialogue that they did in her own voice, um, and so in a lot of ways that's showing that you know she's been in control of all the boss. Uh, Medulla has been in in charge of all the bosses all this time. Yeah, some really neat visual storytelling as well as the actual storytelling where we're finally getting to the conclusion and having all the big reveals about the game's plot. It's not the most complicated plot, but I, I think it really works to sell the location and the feel of the game. Mm. Yeah. It, it was really nice to kind of revisit both some new mechanics, oh, so invent new mechanics with the, the dome mm. levels, and also then revisit the bosses. Um, the, the music in this level is sort of uh, uh, like a montage of all of the previous uh, boss battle music. Um, with uh, with moments of of unique medulla music as well. Yeah, it's a remix, just like the fight itself, right? Yeah, Where that's right. That's right. You're coming in, and what's old is new again, mm -hmm. and that was very important to us to get that feeling all right. Uh, I think every classic game that you can think of from the kind of era that that, that Cactus is obviously inspired by has this feeling, this emotion come through at the end that you need to. Uh, revisit where you've been in order to move on to new and interesting experiences. Mm. It's so brutal. Uh, she, she's so... Oh, I just feel like when I get through some of these phases, when I get to the phase with the homing bullets firing at you, mm. uh, my heart rate increases. <laughs> it doubles yeah. mm. every I time. I was really proud of this, this boss fight for two reasons, both how it contrasts with um, Venom, who's like being introduced as the physically largest boss, and then you go, well, how do you go larger than that? And Medulla encompasses a ship, like the entire stage is her body, but she's even bigger than this, and you're just seeing a fraction of it. And also how she contrasts with uh, Licorice, um, where you know, you've got an android who has all of your strengths. <laughs> effectively um, and then you go back to the you get to finish on this this big traditional bullets you know chaos action everywhere it's really a celebration of everything in, in the game not just the bosses that you've already defeated but all of the mechanics and systems the bullet hell the swirling elements the lasers it's a beautiful collage of all the, the cool things that you've enjoyed up until now in their most pure form in one fight. 
Yeah, yeah it, was, it was supposed to kind of really be a best of uh, boss fight. <laughs> Just throwing together all these elements. But at the end of the best of, you still need something new and fresh and exciting as well, which uh, hopefully is how people feel about the final moments. Uh, I'm, I'm not so sure. Yeah, it was a, it was an interesting one. We we're planning it out. Like we wanted to we wanted to have a fake out. We wanted to we wanted to mess with the player. Mm. And then you go back to that classic classic retro style. Mm. The ether sphere. <laughs> the I'd like to visit the ether sphere. You got one battery, you got limited enemies, and no, you can't shoot the big thing in the center, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've had some interesting reactions to it, like uh, some people some people kind of really get it, some people have either misinterpreted or, or, or been frustrated with it, but I still, I still feel really good about how it distills the purity of what Cactus is about gameplay-wise into a short segment. Yeah, 60 seconds of the purest gameplay across the entire game, which is really nice as a finisher for a boss that's also about showcasing the best elements of the entire game. Yeah. Uh, in this 60 seconds, you have to dodge better than you've ever dodged, shoot better than you've ever shot, use your weapons better than you've ever used them, you know, kind of like swapping between them, I mean. And it's just this kind of perfect moment of when you get to the end, you should feel like you're the best you that you've ever been across the entire campaign. Yeah, it's like the final exam. You sh you've been training the whole game for this. Mm. I th I, from a music perspective, it, the, the, it gets the heaviest that the, the soundtrack gets. Uh, it's the fa like fastest, most full-on uh, intense music bit there. Uh, I got crazy weird choirs, distorted choir samples going on and uh, and uh, super fast guitars and um, yeah at one point like I know it, when I was mixing it it was the whole like my system was just like everything was just going full on and on the edge of overloading and stuff but it <laughs> felt appropriate it's, for the moment. You know? I think it's the yeah it's the most intense song in the game and mm. it's, it's great because it just builds steadily for a yeah. whole minute yeah. and then kind yeah. of climaxes. Yeah, yeah. And after that climax the game is done. You get to move on to the complete screen, and with that, our developer commentary is also done. I hope you've enjoyed listening. Thank you very much. We'll see you next time. <laughs>